I want to thank everyone for being here in the live webinar. This is the second part of, the, of this webinar, moving from CCNA to HCIA. Uh, our presenter, uh, Walid, um, he did a great job last time, I think uh, many of you know. So we are looking forward to the second part of this webinar and maybe even more webinars in the future. Um, there was a lot of great feedback about this webinar, so I think um, we have many participants interested in this topic, which is great. Uh, if you have any uh, suggestions for us, please use the chat option to uh, send your suggestions. You can send it to me in private or uh, send it to everyone, however you prefer. Okay, uh, now Walid, I will la uh, let you take over and uh, in case uh, there's an issue with the sound or anything like that, I will, I will let you know, but let's hope everything will be okay. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Elena for the, for the introduction and for the, giving me the second chance of, of presenting the, the session moving from CCNA to HCIA part two. And also, I would like to thank uh, Huawei Enterprise Forum uh, for this chance also. So uh, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, actually, this is a brief of, uh, of me, and I think uh, you should uh, already have known this from the first part. So I don't want to go through this again. Uh, so um, as the title tells us, moving from CCNA uh, routing and switching, or CCNA in general, to HCIA data communication, uh, I did this session uh, in two parts. The first part, actually, I covered uh, a couple of topics regarding uh, how to move on from, um, from CCNA to HCIA data communication. And today I will try to cover the second part. Uh, in this part, uh, or in this session, I will be covering uh, four main topics, which I think are very important for you to, to do the move correctly and smoothly. Um, the, the four topics are VLAN and inter-VLAN routing, the ACL implementation and the DHCP implementation and the IPv6 deployment. Uh, at the end, uh, actually, you, uh, as Ellen mentioned, you, you should be having a chance of sending uh, your queries or your questions uh, in the forum, probably. So now let's start uh, with the first uh, topic, which is VLANs and inter-VLAN routing. Uh, VLAN, as all of you should, uh, should know this from the CCNA, VLAN stands for Virtual Local Area Network, which is a concept of dividing a switch into virtual switches, uh, or dividing the switch into smaller groups or virtual groups. Actually, this could be the, the beginning of the virtualization, the, the term that probably is a, is a hot topic nowadays or a, a trending topic, virtualization. Virtualization is, uh, actually started uh, uh, very uh, probably many years ago uh, when we did the VLAN. VLAN actually is a virtualization of the switches. So uh, VLAN is a way of dividing the switch into virtual switches or virtual group. Um, I'm just going to explain this in the whiteboard, probably gonna be better. So if I got a switch here, we can uh, imagine or we can think that this, th this switch is a 24 ports. By default, all the ports of the switch are belonging to a group, we call it VLAN 1. The idea of VLANs is no, is to divide this switch into two VLANs, three VLANs, or probably a couple of VLANs. For example, I can come to this switch and just divide this switch. I can see the ports from one to five will be belonging to VLAN two. And the ports from six to 10 will be belonging to VLAN three. And um, from 10 to 24, 
are belonging to <coughs> VLAN 4. So when you divide the switch into VLANs or into virtual switches, as if you have done this, the switch has become smaller switches. So someone could ask me, what is the benefit of doing this? What is the benefit of uh, virtualizing the switch or dividing the switch into virtual switches? Actually, we have got many benefits. The first one is, segmentation or segmenting the network. Probably you could be uh, working in a company. That company has got three or four departments. Department, department one, department two, department three. And you don't want communication between those three departments for, a, for any reason. If you want to do this, the simplest way of doing this is to divide the switches of the building into VLANs. VLAN 2, VLAN 3, VLAN 4. Why? Because when you divide the switch into VLANs, normally the VLANs cannot communicate with each other unless there is a layer 3 device or there is a router. So when you do the VLAN implementation, actually, you are not allowing the communication between those VLANs unless there is a layer 3 device or a router. So if you've got a department, uh, or sorry, you've got a company, and this company has got many departments, and you don't want the communication between those departments, you can do the VLANs. Also in the ISPs companies, if I got an ISP like this, uh, and the ISP has got many customers connected to its network. Say we got customer A connected here, customer B connected here, customer C connected in this port. Actually, definitely, uh, the ISP doesn't want intercommunication between those three customers. So what can we do, or what is the primitive way of, of separating the customer traffic? We can separate them by putting this port into VLAN 2, this port into VLAN 3, and this port into VLAN 4. So the segmentation is one of the use cases of implementing the VLAN, okay? The second advantage or the second benefit of doing the VLAN is the flexibility. The way of doing the VLAN or implementing the VLAN is very flexible. I'm going to explain this in the slides here. Uh, suppose we have got this company that, that got three departments, the sales department, the HR department, and the engineering department. And uh, they are distributed in three floors. Suppose that we got the, this engineering guy who is in the first floor and uh, has been promoted to the, probably to the manager's floor. And uh, this guy, when moved to the manager's floor, he want to be belonging to the same VLAN or to the same department. Is that going to be difficult? Is it going to need any physical recabling? No. What you have to do is just to go to this port and assign this port into the engineering VLAN. So, the implementation of VLAN is very flexible. The third actual advantage or the, the third benefit of doing the VLAN is the security. So, <coughs> and actually this is considered one of the, one of the main actual benefits of, of doing the VLAN is the security. Uh, I'm just going to clean the board. Uh, normally when we don't implement VLAN, all PCs that are connected to the switch, 
are belonging to the same VLAN, as I mentioned earlier, which is VLAN 1. Second thing, that all PCs belonging to the same VLAN, actually they are belonging to the same broadcast domain. When I say belonging to the same broadcast domain, that means if I got computer A here, and this computer sent a broadcast message, this broadcast message will be sent to the all computers in the same VLAN, which is not good at all, actually, because this is considered one of the uh, security vulnerabilities in my network. Why? Because all PCs in this network or or all PCs in, the, in, the, in this VLAN, one of them can be a hacker and can sniff the traffic that sent in a broadcast manner. And also this hacker can use this scenario to send his traffic to know the IP address of the PCs who are belonging to the same VLAN or to the same group. So when we divide the switch into VLANs, actually we are dividing the broadcast domain into multiple broadcast domains. Because if I got those PCs into VLAN 2 and those PCs into VLAN 3, normally what I have done, I have done also dividing the broadcast domain. This will be a broadcast domain A and this will be broadcast domain B. What does that mean? If you are in VLAN 2 and you send the broadcast message, you actually, or your broadcast message will be sent to the group of computers who are only belonging to this VLAN. But your broadcast message will never move to the, to the other broadcast domain or to the other VLAN. So by implementing the VLAN, we divide the broadcast domain, which improves or make them the network much, much more secure than before. So this is the third benefit and considered uh, the main benefit of, of doing the VLAN or implementing the VLAN. So let's repeat this again. We got three benefits of doing the B VLAN, segmentation, flexibility of, of the VLAN implementation, and the security. I'm just covering actually what you have uh, or you should be uh, knowing from the CCNA course. So yes, uh, one of the main goals of the, v, uh, the, the VLAN is the security. It's considered one of the security levels of, uh, of doing a VLAN because flat network or one broadcast domain network is not secure at all. Uh, and also I explained that when you divide the network into VLANs, you actually dividing the broadcast domain. You, uh, you configure the broadcast domain to be smaller. And that is good uh, regarding the security, the security rules of our network. Now, if I want to, to do this VLAN configuration or the VLAN implementation, how the VLAN or based on what I'm dividing the VLAN, we have got two types of implementation. I'm going to cover one of them actually in this, in this session. We got the static VLAN and the second one is the dynamic VLAN. The static VLAN implementation is the one that I have already explained, is that if I got a network or a switch who has get, got like uh, 24 ports and I want to divide the switch into VLANs, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to say the ports from one to four will be belonging to VLAN five, from five to 10 will be belonging to VLAN 10 and so on. So the, the, division, the division of VLANs or the implementation of VLANs will be based on the ports or on the switch ports. However, we got another way of doing the VLAN, which is the dynamic VLAN. The dynamic VLAN actually is based on the MAC address, not based on the MAC address, sorry, not based on the, on the port numbers. I can say in the dynamic VLAN implementation, uh, the computers who have MAC address of A, B, or C will be belonging to VLAN 10. So when I say this, those computers, A, B, or C, wherever port that they are connecting to, they will be belonging to the VLAN 10. So this is a dynamic expressions comes from. It's not relevant to what ports are you connected to. No, it's actually uh, uh, tied to your MAC address. So this is why we say this, this type of VLAN is a dynamic VLAN, but uh, as I just mentioned, I'm going to 
explain the static VLAN one and do the configuration of it in this session. Now let's move in, in the VLAN implementation to a very, very important concept, which is a trunk concept. Let me move again to the, to the whiteboard. <coughs> Suppose we have got a switch here. And we got computer A or port one belonging to VLAN two. And we got another port, which is port two, computer B, that is belonging to VLAN three. And if I ask you, can computer A communicate with computer B? You will answer me, definitely not. Why? Because they are belonging to two different VLANs and they cannot communicate together unless we got a layer three device or we got a router. Right, but if I connect this switch to another switch, port three, and we connect it port one here, C into VLAN two, and I ask you, is the communication between A and C is going to work? you will say mm, probably yes. Why? Because they are belonging to the same VLAN. But actually the answer is no. Why? Because A, when tries to communicate with C, they are belonging to the same VLANs, yes. But the communication will be passing through port three. And the port three is by default belonging to VLAN one. So the communication will not work. Why? Because A is trying, A is in VLAN 2, is trying to send his traffic through a port that is belonging to a different VLAN. So how can we fix this problem? Actually, very easy. You can just come to port 3 and just put it into VLAN 2. If I did this, A and C will work and the communication will work fine. But if I got a, another computer here, which is D belonging to VLAN three, and I ask you, is the communication between B and D will work? The answer will be no. Why? Because B is in VLAN three, is trying to send his traffic to D in VLAN three, but through port three, which is belonging to VLAN two. So how can we fix this problem? Actually, is that the intuitive way is to link the two switches with another port, say port five, and put this port into VLAN three. C, uh, sorry, B and D will be communicating through port five. A and C will be communicating through port three. However, this solution has fixed this problem but is not scalable at all. Why? Because if I got like 100 VLANs in this side and 100 VLANs in this side, the communication will not work or it's not scalable. Why? Because you need to connect those two switches using 100 cables. And that is, is not possible, by the way. So the trunk actually is a solution of connecting only one link through only one port but doing a special configuration to this port to make it as a trunk. The trunk is a configuration for this port to allow this port sending all VLANs traffic through this port. So the trunk is a port or is a way of configuring the port to allow this port to send all VLANs traffic through this port. And how can I do this? When got computer A in VLAN 2 sending his traffic, when the traffic comes to the trunk, it will be added identifier, say VLAN 2, to identify this, v, this traffic is belonging to VLAN 2. Why? Because when I reach the other switch, the other switch from this identifier can know that this traffic should be only sent to, to the VLAN 2 PCs. Many people actually, uh, 
have a misconception regarding trunk. Many people think that trunk is a way of making different VLANs connecting together, and that is wrong. Trunk is not making different VLANs to connect together. No, the trunk is allowing same VLAN in different switches to connect together or, or to communicate together. So this is the implementation of the trunk, is to make the same VLAN in different switches to, to connect together or to communicate together. So if I did the trunk configuration, here the red VLAN can communicate with the red VLAN in the other switch. The black VLAN can communicate with the black VLAN in the other switch. The green VLAN can communicate with the green VLAN in the other switch using the trunk configuration or the trunk port. Okay, guys. <coughs> so we got two types of links or two types of, uh, of port configuration. We got the access link and the trunk link. The difference between the access link and the trunk link is as follows. The access link actually is, or the access port is the port that is connected to a certain end device and belonging to a certain VLAN. This we call it access port. However, the trunk port or the trunk link is connecting two switches or three switches together and uh, sending all VLANs traffic through these ports. Normally, the trunk ports actually by by the way, are uh, faster uh, than the access ports. Why? Because they are expected to, to have uh, much volume of traffic compared to the access because they simply carry all VLAN traffic. Now let's move to the configuration of VLANs. Uh, just a minute, guys. I'm just, uh, because it has become hot here, I just want to, to switch on the fan. Okay, so <coughs> now let's move to the configuration of the VLANs. Suppose we have got this scenario. This is a fair switch and computer A should be in VLAN 2, computer B. <clears throat> in VLAN 3, this is port 2, this is port 3. And we got another switch here. Uh, 2 and 3, this is PCC belonging to VLAN 2. And this is belonging to VLAN Three. Normally, different VLANs should be having different networks. So, A should be assigned IP address of 10.0.0.2, and this one should be assigned 10.0.0.3. B and D should be belonging to a different network, like 20.0.0.2 and 20.0.0.3. So, if I want to make this scenario by uh, implementing or doing the VLAN, we have got three steps of doing the, the VLAN computation. The first one is the VLAN creation. The second one is the port assignment. The third one is the trunk configuration. Okay, the VLAN creation, if I want to make this scenario, normally all the ports of the switch, as I mentioned earlier, should be belonging to VLAN 1. So imagine that we got a box here, which is representing VLAN 1, and in this box I have got all ports in it. 24 ports belonging to VLAN 1. So to do this scenario, first of all, I want 
to make the new divisions or to uh, I want to, to configure the new VLANs because in this switch I got only VLAN one. So the first step is to do the VLAN creation to make the new boxes which are VLAN 2 and VLAN 3. When doing the VLAN creation, actually I'm creating those two VLANs. However, I did create those two VLANs, but all the ports are belonging to VLAN 1 still. So the second step is to move the specified ports or the connected ports to the, to the equivalent VLAN. So I have to configure port 2 should be belonging to VLAN 2. Port 3 should be belonging to VLAN 3, right? And the same thing in in the other switch. So I have I have to move this port into VLAN 2 and this port should be into VLAN 3, right? The third step is to do the trunk configuration to make this port, suppose that is port 4, to be as a trunk to allow the same VLAN in different switches to communicate together or to carry all VLAN traffic in switch one and switch two. So this is the third step. After, after I finish the three steps of, of the VLAN configuration, we can expect VLAN two pinging or communicating with VLAN two in the other switch. VLAN three communicating with VLAN three in the other switch. Okay, so let's see how can we do this in in Huawei commands. So the VLAN creation in the switches, first of all, you have to log into the switch. You have to then move to the, to the system view by typing this command, system view. This is from the first part, by the way. Now we should configure the VLAN 2, quit, VLAN 3, quit. Here I have created two VLANs, VLAN 2 and VLAN, VLAN 3. Second step is to do the port assignment. I have to log into the port 2, interface gigabit ethernet 002, and to uh, specify the type of this port, which is axis, by typing this command, port link type axis, which is equivalent to the switch port mode axis, if you can remember from the CCNA. Port default VLAN 2, that means this port will be assigned to VLAN 2, which is equivalent to the switch port access VLAN 2 in the, in the CCNA to the Cisco guys. We will do the same thing for, for port 3, the phase gigabit ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 3, port link type access, port default VLAN 3. Finally, the third step is to make the link between the two switches as a trunk, port link type trunk, and to, uh, you can specify, or in, in Huawei, by the way, you have to specify which VLAN are allowed to, uh, to pass through this trunk. I have got only two VLANs, so I can configure it as port trunk allow pass VLAN two to three. I'm allowing the, the two VLANs or the two configured VLANs to pass through this trunk. So after I finish the configuration, I'm expecting VLAN two, VLAN two can communicate together, VLAN three, VLAN three can communicate together. But VLAN two cannot communicate up to this moment with VLAN 3. Why? Because we haven't got a layer 3 device. We haven't got uh, a router in, in, in our network. So this, uh, this uh, uh, configuration, we call it inter-VLAN routing, when we want the communication between two different VLANs to happen. So here, I'm expecting to have router one connected to one of the switches or a layer 3 device connected to one of the switches and this device should be working as as an inter vlan router okay how can we configure this device or this layer 3 device first of all you have to configure the vlans on it vlan 2 quit vlan 3 quit secondly this port between the router and the switch because this port is expected to carry all VLANs traffic should be configured as a trunk. How can we do this? Same way as we did in the switches. Interface Ethernet 000, this is the router port or the layer 3 switch port. 
port link type trunk. This is a trunk. Port trunk allow pass VLAN two to three. Now I specified which VLANs are allowed to pass through this trunk. Uh, secondly, or thirdly, in the, in the router, we have to configure interfaces. We call them VLAN interfaces. They are like virtual interfaces. Uh, one of the interfaces is representing VLAN 1, and the other is representing VLAN 3. I have to go interface VLAN IF2 and give it IP address, IP address 10.0.0.1.255.0.0.0. This IP address should be the IP address from the range of VLAN 2. And and to shut down that port, or sorry, and to shut down that VLAN. Now move to the other VLAN, which is uh, VLAN 3, VLAN IF3, IP address 20.0.0.0.1.255.0.0.0, and to shut down. OK, so here. We have to connect a router. And this cable or this port should be trunk. And we have to configure VLAN IF2 and VLAN IF3. This, if you, if you remember CCNA well, or uh, you remember the, the switching part, these are equivalent to the SVI configuration in the layer 3 switch, the switch virtual interfaces. Some of you could ask me, uh, is there any way to do the same thing in the, uh, as we did in Cisco, of uh, dividing the port into like sub-interfaces? Yes, you can do this. But I, I, I have chosen this, this way, 10.0.0.1, and here, 20.0.0.1, and that. VLAN 2 PCs should be having a default gateway of 10.0.0.1, 10.0.0.1. And the 20 network, or VLAN 3, should be uh, configured with a default gateway of 20.0.0.1, 20.0.0.1. After configuring all these steps, you are expecting the ping or the communication between all devices should be working fine because I have brought or configured the inter-VLAN router or the inter-VLAN layer 3 device. So let's move to the, to do this in the lab. Um, so this lab one, which is VLANs and inter-VLAN routing, I have to log into this PC And the PC should be configured with the IP address uh, 10.0.0.2, the mask 255.0.0.0, and the gateway is 10.0.0.1. The other PC, 20.0.0.2, and uh, the mask 255.0.0.0, and the gateway is 20.0.0.1. This one, 10.0.0.3, and the gateway is 10.0.0.1, which is supposed to be in VLAN 2. And this one is 20.0.0.3, and the gateway 20.0.0.1, uh, belonging to, uh, to VLAN, VLAN 3. So now let's move to the configuration of the switches. First of all, let's, uh, uh, let's ignore the router. I'm going to do the configuration in the switches only. So just let's check the configuration before we, we move on. Yes, the switch doesn't have configuration. Uh, <coughs> the first step is of the doing VLANs is creating the VLANs. Okay, so I'm just going to configure VLAN 2. I can give it a name here, but I'm just going to quit. VLAN 3, and I'm going to quit. 
let's uh, maximize the window. Uh, secondly, I'm just going to do the port assignment, which ports belonging to which VLAN. So I will move to the first port, which is gigabit ethernet 002. Port link type access, right? And port default VLAN 2. This port is belonging to VLAN 2. I will move to the other port, which is 3. Port link type axis or default VLAN 3. Save the port between the two switches uh, should be configured as, as a trunk, which is interface gigabit ethernet 004, port link type trunk, port trunk, allow pass VLAN 2 to 3. Okay, so this is the configuration of, of the first switch. Right, this one. Port 2 in VLAN 2, port 3 in VLAN 3, and the link between the two switches should be a trunk. I'm going to do the same configuration in the other switch. Here, yeah. system view, VLAN 2, quit, VLAN 3, quit, interface gigabit ethernet 002, port link type, axis port default VLAN 3, sorry, uh, port default VLAN 2, interface gigabit ethernet 003, port link type axis, port default VLAN 3, and the link between the two switches should be trunk, interface gigabit ethernet 004, port link type trunk, port trunk allow pass VLAN 2 to 3. Now let's try to do the ping between VLAN 2 and VLAN 3 in the other switch. Here, yeah, go to the CMD ping 10.0.0.3. The ping is working because I am communicating with the PC in the same VLAN in the other switch by, by, uh, by using the trunk actually. But if I try to ping the VLAN 3, in the same switch, in the same switch, so ping 20.0.0.2. Look at this destination host unreachable. There is no way of communicating between the two VLANs or the two different VLANs unless we we add the layer three device or the router. So now let's move to the configuration of the of the of the router. System view. So first of all, we have to create the VLANs. We have to configure the port between the router and the switch to be as trunk interface Ethernet 000. This is a port in the router that is connected to the first switch. Port link type trunk for trunk allow pass VLAN 2 to 3. Sorry, it's not exit, it's a quit. So uh, now let's configure the, the VLAN IF. VLAN IF 2. And the shutdown IP address, give it the IP address of in the range of VLAN 1, 255000, and VLAN 
I if three and to shut down IP address twenty zero zero one and the mask is two five five zero zero zero. Okay. Now I supposed to be finished from the router configuration. I will move to this switch. I have to configure this port, which is gigabit ethernet 001 to be as a trunk also. Interface gigabit 001, port link type, trunk, port trunk, allow pass VLAN 2 to 3. So now I'm done. Let's uh, try to test the inter VLAN routing. Let's move to the, the first PC and try to ping again, 20.002. Yes, here we go. The ping is working between 10.002 and 20.002, which are belonging to two different VLANs. How this happened, actually I did add the router and make the configuration of doing the inter VLAN routing between those two VLANs. Let's try to ping 20.003, which is the, the other VLAN in the other switch. All working. So I managed to do the inter-VLAN routing by doing the configuration of the, of the route. Now let's move to the second step, which is the ACL, access control list. ACL or access control list, this probably considered one of the basic concepts in the network security. Normally in network security or in firewall in specific, we call it packet filtering. So uh, as we all know in the firewalls, one of the basic functions that the firewall did for our network is a packet filtering. And the packet filtering actually can be done through a couple of ways, but one of the ways that we can do the packet filtering is the ACL or the access control list. So the access list or the access control list is actually a, a very straightforward way of doing the packet filtering. However, the ACL doesn't only do the packet filtering. It can be used as a traffic classifier. It does help us a lot in classifying the traffic. It can be used in um, uh, root filtering. It can be used as a, pack, as a traffic classifier in quality of service. It can be used in the, lots, of, um, lots of use cases of ACL as a traffic classifier, not as a packet filter only, okay? But in this, in this session, I'm going to explain the ACL or the access control list as a packet filter, okay? So, as I... <coughs> As I have already mentioned this, ACL is a set of rules and actually uh, it does have uh, two types of rule, either permitting the traffic or denying the traffic. And when we apply the ACL, normally we apply the ACL in the router in a certain interface and we apply it either to the incoming traffic or to the inbound traffic or can be applied to the outbound traffic or to the outgoing traffic. And uh, ACL is very similar to the way that we do in, in Cisco. We have got two types of, uh, of ACL. We've got the basic ACL and the advanced ACL. These are equivalent in Cisco to the standard and the extended ACL. The basic is equivalent to the standard ACL and the advanced is equivalent to the extended ACL. The main difference between the basic ACL and the advanced ACL is that 
basic ACL, when it does filtering, it does, it does uh, do the filtering based only on the source of the traffic. However, the advanced ACL can make a filter based on the source, destination, protocol, port number of the traffic. Let's explain this much better here. If I got a network like this, Uh, 10, 0, 0, 2. 10, 0, 0, 1. Yeah, we've got 15, 0, 0, 1. In the basic ACL, Normally, the basic ACL uh, or the ACL in general has got numbers. The basic ACL in Huawei <coughs> has got the range, I mean the ACL number, has got the range between 2000 and 2099. If, I, if you got ACL with, with a number in this range, it's going to be a basic ACL. The advanced ACL is the ACL that is having a number in the range between 3,000 and 3,099. Basic ACL, if I did basic ACL configuration, suppose in router one, is going to filter the traffic like that. Deny the traffic that is coming from 10.0.0 network. It does make a deny or a permit based only on the source of the traffic. However, in the advanced ACL, I can design or configure the ACL as follows. I can say deny the traffic that is coming from, from the 10.0.0 network moving to the 20.0.0 network, TCP traffic going to port eight so in the advanced acl i can make the filter not only based on the source address no i can include the source of the traffic the destination of the traffic and the protocol and even the port number that i'm i'm, I'm, I'm going to okay so this is the difference between implementing uh, the basic acl and the advanced acl So uh, here I will take the example of uh, doing the <coughs> of the advanced ACL configuration. Uh, you go to the system view of the router, ACL. You type the number in the range of the advanced ACL between 3000 and 3099. I uh, chose uh, 3001. Rule 10, this is going to be the first rule, deny ICMP. I have specified the protocol, which is ICMP, the ping protocol. Source, the source is 10002. 0000, 0000 means that I mean this specific IP address. Why? Because this is the wild mask. The wild mask tells us which part that you want to compare when you want to deny. So if I typed in the wild mask 0000, it means that I'm comparing the four octets. So it means that I need this IP address, 10.0.0.2. However, if I type 0.255.255.255, the 255 or the ones in the wild mask mean that I don't want to compare this part. So I, if I type 0.255.255.255, it means that the source, any IP address that is starting with 10. However, in this example, I'm typing 0, 0, 0, 0, which means that I mean this IP address, 10, 0, 0, 0, 2 as a source. The destination is N. So this ACL will be denying the, IC, the ICMP traffic that is coming from the 10, 0, 0, 2, moving to any destination. Rule 20, 
permit IP source any, destination any, which will be permitting the IP traffic that is coming from any source moving to any destination. And now, how can we apply this ACL? We move to the interface, for example, Gigabit Ethernet 000, that is going to be one of the router ports. Traffic filter, you have to specify the ACL. Is it going to be applied inbound or outbound? Is it going to be applied to the incoming traffic or to the outgoing traffic in this interface? Here I have chosen inbound, and then I have to type the ACL number, which is ACL 3001, okay? So let's see this in the, in the lab, which is lab two, ACL. Let me check, are the IP addresses uh, configured in the PCs? Yes, it's configured. So uh, before doing anything, I'm just going to, to configure the network to make it function or operating normal without ACL. By doing the configuration of those two interfaces, those two interfaces and enable the routing protocol between those two routers. So let's try this. Actually, this is from the first part. System view interface gigabit 000 and to shut down, give it IP address 10001 and the mask, we can say slash eight. Interface gigabit 001 and to shut down, IP address 15001 slash eight, slash eight as if I wrote 255000. Now let's enable the RIP, RIP, network 10.0.0.0, network 15.0.0.0, version two. Okay. Let's move to the second router. System view, interface gigabit 0.0.0, and shut down. IP address 10001255000 interface gigabit ethernet 001 and to shut down IP address 15002255000 let's enable the rip rip version 2 network 2000 Network 15.0.0.0. Now let's try to make the ping before we do the ACL. That is very important because sometimes people do the configuration of the RIP and do the configuration of the ACL and make the ping and the ping uh, uh, didn't work and they will be happy. Oh, uh, I have done this and uh, the ACL is working. No, it could be not working because you haven't done the RIP correctly or you haven't done the 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 gigabit ethernet 00 IP address assignment correctly. So first of all, I have to make sure that the pink is working or the communication is working without applying the ACL. So uh, I will move to the command prompt and ping <coughs> 10002. Yes, here we go. The ping is working before we apply the ACL. Now, let's apply the ACL in this route. The ACL will be advanced ACL to block the 10.0.0.2 from going anywhere. So I will use advanced ACL, ACL 3001, the same one in the slides. Rule 10, deny ICMP source 10.0.0.2, the wild mask 0.0.0.0, destination any. Rule 20, permit IP any, sorry, IP source any to destination any. Now let's move to that 
gigabit ethernet 000 to apply this acl by doing this command traffic filter inbound acl 3001 okay let's test this by uh, going to the 10002 and try to ping the same ip address yes now i should be happy why because the the ping didn't work after i have applied the acl from the 10002 let's try to to do the ping from the the 10003 which is the other pc that is not denied in our acl make a ping to 20.002. This should work. Yes. Why? Because this IP address, the 10.003, is not denied in my ACL. So this is actually a, a very simple implementation and explanation for, for the ACL or access control list. Let's move to the, to the third part in, in our session, which is the DHCP, the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. The DHCP is a way of IP address assignment. For example, if I got a network like this, got many, many PCs, and if I have been asked to assign IP addresses to those PCs, how can I do this? Actually, IP address assignment in IPv4, we've got, we've got two types of assignment. IP address assignment. We've got two types of assignment. We got the static one and the dynamic one. The static one means that you have to move to everyone, every single PC and manually assign it IP address. That is okay if if uh, if the number of PCs that I have is, uh, is not huge. However, if I got like many, many computers in my network and I want to assign them IP address, that will be actually a, a, a very tough job. Why? Because you have to do uh, a huge admin work. This is the first problem. The second problem is that you can't guarantee that you, ca you probably could have two PCs having the same IP address or you can have uh, IP address conflict when you do that manually because human errors actually are, are, are very common in, in, in IT world. The other thing, which is the, the preferred one, is doing it through DHCP. DHCP, you can be using a DHCP server in your network or a router or a device that is representing a DHCP server, which its main function is to distribute IP addresses dynamically to those PCs. That is going to be very easy job for you as a network engineer. And the other thing, to some extent, you can guarantee that no two, um, uh, no PCs can have the same IP address. Why? Because it has been centralized, distributed through, through the DHCP. So the DHCP is giving those IP addresses, so those PCs IP addresses dynamically, okay, through a DHCP server or a device that is representing a DHCP server. When you configure the PCs or your clients to have their IP addresses dynamically from the DHCP server, uh, the process will be, will be like this. This PC is not having IP address, but it has uh, been instructed to take its IP address dynamically. The PC, when configured to have the IP address through DHCP, first of all, will send a discover message. A discover message is, is, is gonna be like this. Hey everyone, is there anyone at DHCP server? I need an IP address. This message is a broadcast. The server, or if there is a server in your network, a DHCP server, the server will reply with an offer message will tell this client, hey, I'm a DHCP server, 
and this is the IP address and the mask and the gateway that I can offer you. Do you agree? The client will send another message called a request message. Yes, my server, I need this IP address, the mask, the gateway, and the other parameters like DNS server or TFTP server. Then the server will confirm to the client, okay, here we go. Then this is your IP address. This is a mask. This is a gateway you can use. And this is the IP address of the DNS server. These messages between the client and the DHCP server, we normally call them as a DORA messages. Discover, offer, request, and acknowledgement message. DORA, discover, offer, request, acknowledgement message. So here in this slide, I'm going to explain how can we configure Huawei router to work as a DHCP server. First of all, you have to log into the, to the router. You type DHCP enable <coughs> to enable the DHCP. Then you have to create a pool of IP addresses that you want to, to distribute your IP addresses from. So IB pool one network 10.0.0.0, the mask 255.255.0.0. You have to specify the default gateway, gateway list 10001. If you have IP addresses that you, you don't want to distribute because they are assigned statically to other servers, for example, if I got IP address assigned to a DNS server, an IP address assigned to a TFTP server, those IP addresses you don't want to distribute to your client. Why? Because we have got servers have taken those IP addresses. So how can we do the exclusion? We do this like, uh, like this command, exclude address, the IP address that I don't want to distribute, uh, the range from 10.0.0.2 to 10.0.0.100. The final step of doing the DHCP is to go to the router interface, which is facing the DHCP clients. In this example, I. Uh, I move to the interface gigabit ethernet 000, and we do this, DHCP select global, which means that interface gigabit ethernet 000, you have to distribute DHCP to the client from which pool, from the pool that I have configured globally here, okay? And then the DHCP should work fine. Let's check this. which is in lab three. System view. First of all, before doing the DHCP, I have to assign IP address to, to the router interface. So interface gigabit 000. And the shutdown. IP address 10.0.0.1, the mask 255.255.0.0. <coughs> uh, then let's start by enabling the DHCP. DHCP enable. Then I have to specify the pool, IP pool 1 the network that I'm going to distribute my IP address from, network 10.0.0.0, mask 255.255.0.0, and the gateway list 10.0.0.1, and the IPs that I don't want to distribute, or the IPs that I want to execute, I can just specify the IP address from 10.0.0.1 to, sorry, uh, 10.0.0.2, because the gateway cannot be excluded in Hawaii, by the way. 10.0.0.2 to 10.0.0.100. Finally, sorry, equit. Uh, finally, I have to go to the interface gigabit 0.0.0.0 and tell him DHCP select from global pool. Now, <coughs> let's move to the PCs. Yes, here, if you want to configure the, the IPs statically, but 
if you want to, uh, to configure the PCs to take their IP address through DHCP, you do it like this. You move to the DHCP and you select this option. Uh, let's move to the command prompt and type IP config. Here we go. We can see that the, the PC has taken the IP address from the DHCP pool. If we move to the other PC also, IP config 10.0.255.253, okay? As you can see, the, the pool uh, or the IP address has started to be distributed from the end of the pool, from the 253 and and moving down, not from the 10002. Okay. <clears throat> now let's move to the last or to the final part in this uh, webinar or in this session, which is the IPv6 implementation, Internet Protocol version 6. So um, IPv6, as all of you know, that uh, in the mid of 90s, uh, probably around 1995, people in the IT world or in the network uh, world or the researchers have noticed that the IPv4 address will not be suitable in the coming years to accommodate all the end devices in the world. Why? Because simply, the number of IP addresses that it can provide is not large enough. The IPv4 normally actually provides us uh, around 4 billion IP addresses. That is not actually a huge number regarding, uh, uh, regarding end devices. In that time, it was okay, but when the number of devices that started to increase, the number of uh, 4 billion has not become uh, really enough uh, for all end devices to, to, um, to use it, actually. So what they did, they proposed the IP visits. And the solution, actually, is very simple. The IP address or the IPv4 address, the length of the IP address is 32 bits. This is the IPv4 address is around, uh, or actually it's 32 bits, which giving us around 4 billion IPv4 address. The solution is IPv6, which is 128 bits. That is giving us around 34, and in front of it, 37 zeros, which is really a huge number, and uh, is really considered enough, even for the new technologies like IoT, Internet of Things, that not only end device, no, everything is expected to have IPv6 address, the IPv6 address will be okay for that. So, uh, so th that was a solution of the IPv6, Probably it has been proposed around 1995. The IPv6 has been actually started deploying around 2003. The last IPv4 address that has been assigned from IANA, IANA is the authority uh, or the organization that assigning IP addresses to the, to the registries. In Africa, we got like AFRINIC. Uh, in Europe, we have got like RIPE, NCC. Those are the registries who are responsible of giving the IPv4 addresses to the ISPs. And then the ISPs are responsible of giving the IP addresses to the companies or to the enterprises. So the last IP address dropped from the IANA 
to one of the registries that, if I'm not mistaken, that was on the date of 3rd of February, 2011. And now we are in 2022. So we are expecting in a couple of years, the whole world to become IPv6 or pure IPv6 network, okay? So uh, the solution of the IPv6 to give us uh, many, many IPv6 addresses is to increase the length from 32 bits up to 128 bits, okay? So uh, now let's uh, just try to compare between the IPv4 format and the IPv6 format. The IPv4 format was four octets separated by dot. However, in the IPv6, we have got eight octets and separating between the octets using colon. The IPv4 is written in a decimal format. The IPv6 is written in the hexadecimal format. In the hexadecimal format, uh, normally we have got the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and A, B, C, D, E, F, okay? So uh, as you can see, we have got letters here, and this is a way of, of doing the hexadecimal format. However, administrators actually, when they, they saw this IP, this address, is going to be very difficult for them to configure because it's a lengthy, address so they discussed a way of how can we shorten or make the configuration or the expression of the ipv6 short so to do this they did actually three rules the first rule they mentioned that any zeros in the beginning of the octet can be omitted when writing the ipv6 so instead of writing zero dba we can just write db8. Instead of writing 0012, we can just write 12. This is the first rule, is omitting the leading zeros in any octet. The second rule is if I got like an uh, octet full of zeros, like this one, this can be represented only by one zero. Also, this is full of zeros, can be represented as a one zero. The third rule is that if I got like uh, many consecutive octets who are full of zeros, we can replace them by double colon. So if I got two octets of zeros, I can replace them with a single double colon. Three consecutive octets of zeros, I can make them only double colon. Four octets also single double colon. However, this third rule can be done only once in the IPv6 address. I mean, if I got like zeros here, I can't replace them with a double colon. Every single IPv6 address should be having only one double colon uh, in its representation. Actually, these three rules help administrators or network engineers to configure the IPv6 uh, with, with much less effort. So this way, we can say, we can represent IPv6 like this. Or this can be a valid IPv6. Why? Because between this one and this one, we got double call. So we got a couple of zeros or a couple of octets who are fully zeros. Okay, so this is a valid IPv6 address. So here, <coughs> those leading zeros, I can, um, or I can represent all these zeros as double colon, but I can't represent those zeros as a double colon because the third rule tells us to do the double column only once in the IPv6 address. So I can represent those zeros as single zero here and a single zero here. 
Now let's move to the configuration of the IPv6. First of all, in order to configure the IPv6 in Huawei routers, you have to, to log into the system view. You enable the IPv6 routing this way, IPv6. And you move to the interfaces. You move to the interface via Ethernet 000. And you shut down. You enable the IPv6 in the interface in this way, IPv6 enable. You assign it IPv6 address, IPv6 address, 2001, double colon, one, slash, 64, which means that the 64, the first 64 represent the network part, the other 64 uh, represent the host part. It's like the subnet mask. In the IPv6, how can we do the routing? If I got this network, this is the one that I'm going to configure in a minute. Two thousand and two, two thousand and one, two. So uh, in IPv4, when we intend to configure the routing protocol, we go to router one, we type router rig, and we advertise the network, network 10.0.0.0, network 15.0.0.0. In IPv6, we don't do it this way. In IPv6, we move to every single interface and we enable RIP on it. I move to every single interface and enable RIP on it. Also this way, this way. So normally the routing protocols in IPv6 is implemented by moving to every interface and enable the, the, the routing protocol on that interface. When I enable the, the, the routing protocol in the interface, the router will start advertising the networks that is associated with, with this interface. Also will, will advertise the network that is associated with this interface and so on. So here we can see, after I move to the interface, assigned IPv6 address, I enable the routing protocol this way, RIP NG 100, enable. That will enable the RIP on this interface. Uh, I will move to the second interface, interface Gigabit Ethernet 001, and to shut down IPv6 <coughs> enable. Give it IPv6 address 2003, double colon one, RIP NG100 enable. We will do the same thing for the, for the, second, for the second route. And the ping should be working fine between the two IPv6 addicts. We can see this here in the last lab. Here you can see that uh, I assigned the IPv6 address to the PCs. 2001, 2000, sorry, 2001, 2, 2001, 1 as a gateway. Here, 2004 to 2004-1. This is for the, for the second PC. Now let's move to the, to the router configuration. System view, IPv6 to enable the IPv6 routing. Interface gigabit ethernet 000. And to shut down. Enable the IPv6 on this interface. IPv6 enable. IPv6 address 2001 slash 64. RIP NG 100 enable. I will move to the second interface. Gigabit Ethernet 
when and shut down IPv6 address. Sorry, uh, IPv6 enable IPv6 address 2003 double colon one slash 64 enable the rip rip ng hundred enable. Uh, now let's move to the second router IPv6 interface gigabit ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 0 and shut down <coughs> IPv6 enable IPv6 address 2004 double colon 1 slash 64 rip ng hundred enable interface gigabit ethernet zero slash zero slash one and we shut down ipv6 enable rip ng hundred sorry uh IPv6 address 2003 double colon 2 slash 64 rip ng hundred enable uh, now uh, let's try to make the ping Ping to the other PC, which is uh, 2004, that we'll call on two. Yes, it's working. <coughs> so uh, I managed to make a ping between two IPv6 addresses. So yes, here we go. I think I'm done. I finished the second part. Uh, by doing the first part and the second part, I think we have done a great job of uh, helping uh, uh, all who are interested to move from CCNA to HCIA. I just try to make it as simple as I can, just to, to let you know that how simple the transition or the movement from the, from the CCNA to, to the HCIA, very similar. As long as you are uh, familiar with the concepts, it's not going to be very difficult at all. It's going to be a couple of hours to start your journey in, uh, in Huawei, devices or Huawei technology and uh, yeah here we go I think I'm um, finished I think I will pass the the mic to Elena yes thank you thank you so much um, I really hope that everyone enjoyed this second session and uh, that they found it useful for their maybe uh, next certification uh, or maybe for anyone who is interested in network concepts um, it applies, I think it's very useful either way. Um, I want to thank you all for attending. Um, as some of you may know, we prepared two different activities so that you get two different chances uh, of winning. Um, one activity was created especially for the ones who are attending this live meeting. The second one is available to everyone who uh, answers the three questions at the end in the forum. Uh, in case you are new to this uh, live webinars, uh, the Huawei Enterprise Support Community is the one hosting the webinars. Uh, this is the official technical community for all Huawei Enterprise products, solutions and certifications. Uh, we have uh, many registered members worldwide. Um, we are hoping to uh, have even more members uh, in the next years. Uh, we have an extensive knowledge base that you can learn from with over 71,000 posts. Um, we have a solving time for technical issues of under 24 hours. So if you post uh, an ask for help uh, post, you'll receive a solution in under 24 hours, maybe even uh, faster than that. Uh, we have also created the public recognition and reward system. Uh, including the Elite Users Program, um, Highcoins, which are the internal uh, virtual currency of this community, and also rewards in the online shop. And we also have monthly activities and webinars like this one. Every month we have new uh, webinars, new activities that you can participate in and win some rewards. 
uh, now I would like to uh, present you the first activity of this uh, live session. If Walid can move to the next slide, please. Okay. Okay, so as I said, we have prepared a live uh, Q&A session. This was created uh, for you who are attending the live webinar. Um, as you can see in the slide, uh, it's very easy. I will send you the link uh, to the post again, in case you don't have it. Uh, you just have to leave a comment, like it says there. Okay. So you need to go here to the post in, uh, in the chat box and leave a comment uh, with the text I attended this webinar in the next 10 minutes. So um, only the ones who comment in the next 10 minutes will be taken into consideration for, the, for these rewards. After you leave the comment, please, uh, thank you. Uh, please also leave a message here in the chat with the text comment share. So you have uh, 10 minutes starting from now to share uh, your comment. So step one is to go to the post and leave a comment with, uh, I attended this webinar. And the second step is to leave a message here in the chat box uh, with the text comment share. Okay, you can continue uh, sharing uh, the comments. Uh, you have uh, en enough time. I will just wait for uh, maybe one more minute and then I will uh, show you the second activity. Um, please leave the, the comment under the webinar post. So leave this comment with, I attended this webinar here under this uh, post, okay? Great, so uh, that's, that's all you need to do. Leave a comment under this post with the text, I attended this webinar. Uh, not here in the chat, please. So in order for your participation to be valid, you need to uh, comment in the forum as well. Okay, so um, five winners will be selected from those of you who uh, attended this live webinar and who also uh, commented under the post. Uh, but we also have another activity. So in case you don't win uh, for this one, you still have a chance to win for the second activity that we have prepared. We have 10 gift cards in total. So you have... Uh, more chances of winning. Okay, we will move to the questions there. Um, I will ask you a little to present the three questions. Uh, the same, uh, mechanism you need to go to this activity post in the community and leave a comment with the answers to the following three questions uh, in a comment below this post so uh, all the participants uh, basically need to go to the same post to leave their comments and answers um, you already have the link in the chat so we can uh, show the actual questions. They are uh, true or false type of questions, not very complicated to answer. Okay, this is question one. If security is one of the VLAN implementation benefits, true or false? But again, you need to go here. So you need to go to this link I shared in the chat and answer there, okay? 
This is question two, also a true or false type of question. Yeah, don't answer here. Answer in a comment under the under the post I shared I shared in the chat box. Okay. So you need to leave a comment there in the in the support community. <laughs> okay. I mean, you can also answer here if you want, but it will not be taken into consideration for the reward. So if you want to win the gift cards, you need to uh, leave your answers in the community, okay? Question three, also true or false? I think quite easy. Uh, don't worry if you if you miss the questions. Uh, I will also uh, upload them in the post. Okay, so you will be able to find them uh, in the post. You can reply later, so don't worry about it. Now we are just showing them to you who are attending the live webinar, just to get a head start. But I will uh, update them in the post uh, in a minute, so you'll find the questions there as well. Okay, so these were the questions. Uh, I think uh, not too complicated to answer them. Uh, I invite all of you to uh, come to the community and uh, participate in the, in the two activities. You still have time to participate in the first one as well. Basically, all you have to do is leave a comment saying that you attended this webinar. This is just to show uh, that we are appreciating your time I know that sometimes it's complicated to attend these live uh, sessions. You have work and uh, I understand it. Uh, it's not that easy. So we truly appreciate you being here in the live session as well. Um, I want to thank you all for attending. I want to thank Walid for hosting. I really hope that uh, we will find a new topic to uh, present in the future. Why not? Um, and I hope to see you all in our next uh, webinar sessions. I wish you all good luck uh, with the activities and also a great day ahead or evening, <laughs> depending on your uh, time zone. So uh, see you all in the community. If you have any feedback, suggestions for us, please feel free to share them uh, there. We are always open to your suggestions. So thank you, Walid. Again, thank you for hosting thank today's you, webinar. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for attending. So please keep uh, commenting uh, in the community uh, for a chance to win one of the 10 gift cards that uh, we have prepared for you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And in case you missed uh, the questions, I will repeat again just to make sure that it's clear for everyone. Uh, in case you missed the questions, don't worry because I will update them right now after we finish uh, the live webinar. I will update them in this post, okay? So please look in the chat. I shared the link to the post. You need to go there and you'll find the questions and you can leave a comment below this post with, uh, with your answers. Okay, so very easy, just uh, answer there. Okay, this was it for today. Thank you again. Have a nice, uh, have a nice day ahead, and uh, thank you. All.